Hello and welcome to another Music Ally Focus with me, Music Ally's editor, Joe Sparrow. And in this episode, we're going to talk about equitable remuneration and how it works out in practice in real life with two people who truly understand the economics and legality of it. Now, what is equitable remuneration or ER? Well, in the UK and some other countries, it's the practice of dividing certain radio play royalties 50-50 between artists and label. And in the UK's long-running parliamentary inquiry into music streaming economics, ER became a widely requested solution to many artists' claims that they were not being paid enough. So we got two people together who really know their stuff to talk about whether applying ER to music streaming is a good idea. And spoiler alert, it might actually leave artists worse off. Stay tuned. We're going to dig into it shortly. Now, what is this Focus podcast? Well, Music Ally, as you know, provides an analysis-rich and contextual guide to the music business. And each of these Focus episodes analyzes one meaningful music business story at a time. This podcast is also going to be fairly quick. It'll take about the same amount of time that Leah Schutkever could, entirely hypothetically, of course, swallow 400 sausages without chewing them. Uh, Leah swallowed 12 in one minute in 2020, and some important context here, only one hand was permitted to touch the sausages, and no chewing was allowed. Now, talking of ingesting a vast number of separate but ultimately connected things, and then trying to explain why you did it in the first place, our two guests are great at analysing a lot of data and documents, and explaining the complex ideas behind them. Dr. Haley Bosher, Senior Lecturer in Intellectual Property Law and Associate Dean at Brunel University London, and Will Page, former Chief Economist at Spotify and PRS for Music, joining us shortly. They explore from a legal and economic perspective which of the three real-world ER options available are the most likely to happen, and they revealed that ER might actually leave artists worse off. So what does the future hold for artist royalties in an environment where many artists still want to be paid differently? And will streaming platforms be able to increase monthly subscription costs in the middle of economic hardship? Haley and Will look ahead and try and navigate the likely path forward. So let's go over to the interview right now. So we're very happy to be joined by Dr. Haley Bosher, Senior Lecturer in Intellectual Property Law and Associate Dean at Brunel University London who's an expert in the field of music copyright, and her work has been cited extensively in academic practitioner and policy outputs. Hello, Haley. Hi, thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you here. And uh, joining Haley is a friend of Music Ally. I'm going to call you that, Will. It's Will Page, the former chief economist at Spotify and PRS for Music, who authors work which shines light on the seething mass of numbers that make up the music industry, uh, and has recently <laughs> published a book called Tarzan Economics. Hello, Will. Great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Now, both Haley and Will are good at explaining complex ideas in their respective fields to people who don't understand them, which makes me the ideal host, I guess. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about equitable remuneration, how it works out in practice, in real life, uh, with two people who truly understand the economics and the legality of it. First, though, one quick question uh, requiring a quick answer from both of you. You're both experts in various elements of music industry, but if you could each only pick one piece of music, what would it be? Uh, Hayley, I'm going to start with you because you recoiled. No, I hate question. these questions. I tell you why, because I'm so uncool. I, do, I never have a good answer for these questions. Do- there is no judgment. This is a safe space. Share with the group. No judgment. It's not. It's not. There will be judgment. One <laughs> piece of music. I mean, that's an absurd question. Will, what's your answer? Well, I, I, I'm going to go to 1989, uh, an album by the US rap band The Jungle Brothers called Fun by the Forces of Nature. Uh, yes. It's a lyric in there, which as a DJ and as a producer, who, by the way, got to number one globally on Mixcloud this year, and there's a lyric in there which goes, getting the message across without crossing over. Whether it's music, whether it's economics, whether it's this podcast, that's what you got to do. Try and get these complex subjects across without diluting them. Look, I don't want to come down on one side of the argument here, but that's a fantastic album. It's one of the best albums to put on at a party of uh, all time. Oh, my so, goodness. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, good. Well, Haley, look, you have a think about it. Haley's trying to say Robson and Jerome, but she just doesn't <laughs> want to go on the record. I can smell it. <laughs> Honestly, I just, because also I think about it so real, like genuinely, what could I listen mm. to over and over again? I mean, I know it's just a question, but I'm like, oh the, the music I've probably listened to the most in my whole life uh, is Matchbox 20, because I used to be obsessed with them when I was young. And 
so now when I listen to them, it's really nostalgic. So it would probably in reality be something like that. But then, it, like I said, it's just, it's not a cool answer. It's they're just genuinely the truth. I'm not looking for coolness. I just want to know the truth. And that's good. I mean, look, music it takes you places, makes you feel something. That's great. That's, that's all we want to know. Matchbox 20 were huge. That's fine. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, the less sort of personal elements uh, of this. Uh, let's start with the... Um, to talk about equitable remuneration. Let's talk about the UK's parliamentary inquiry into streaming economics, which we covered a lot here on Music Ally, of course, and where equitable remuneration was a term that quickly came to dominate the debate and sort of was dangled as a solution. Hayley, Will generously introduced me to a uh, an expression, which I had not heard before, but goes like this, never expect a lawyer to have actually read the law. Now, as an academic... Which, which I'm not sure how I feel about that, but as an academic whose job it is to read the law and has studied the, the the hearings and the written evidence at the parliamentary inquiry, did they do it in this instance? And how how does that all fit together? I mean, I don't know how I feel about that quote either, and I've got a lot of lawyer friends that might be uh, unsure of it. But it is true to a certain extent if you think about the lawyer's job might be more to do with you know reading contracts and reading the actual law. I think the important thing to remember with law is that like it's just it's just a a set of rules that we all agree apply to a certain context well we all agree but you know like the government agree and sometimes the context changes so we need to change the rules it's a bit like if you think of um like in sport so you have the rules of hockey and we're playing on field hockey you're playing on a pitch and then you want to change the hockey game and play it on ice right so we're going to need different equipment and different rules like they use a different stick and they wear different clothes and they introduce an offside rule and They need to break three times instead of two times so that they can repair the ice, right? So the context changes, so the rules of the game have to change. And that is the point in in the streaming inquiry was if the game is the music business, the streaming industry is is kind of like the ice where it's like we're playing the same game, but the context is different. So we have to review the context and decide whether we need new rules or not. And so in the streaming inquiry, there was... It was obviously very, like, you know, you covered it a lot. We've talked about it endlessly. More than 300 pieces of evidence. Loads of people got involved. Everybody had strong views. And then the um, the select committee came out with all these different recommendations and equitable remuneration was one of them. From there, we had um, the government response and they decided to move forward with um, further research on four different points. Again, equitable remuneration was one of them as well so now they're doing further research to decide if this is a rule that we should have but rules are at legal level policy and principle they're more like ideas and ideas are only as good as or as uh, useful I suppose as how they are executed and so it's not just about like can we have this law of extra remuneration we totally can it already exists it's existed in the UK for many years we have it on radio we have it all in Europe um it's about what that actually would look like if we did it and at the legal level it would be more of a principle an idea and then it would be executed through like a model which wouldn't be set in law anyway right so yes because equitable equ- equitable <laughs> remuneration um became Yes, it became a suggestion. It became a uh, a focus in the end because, there, like you said, there was this huge collection of evidence and p- opinions, and it all sort of got channeled one way to get to an endpoint, which I guess is smart because it takes us, it moves the, the conversation along. Equitable remuneration became this sort of not a golden ticket, but it sort of became a sort of oh, this might be a workable solution. Now, Will, you are one of the people who's actually modelled equitable remuneration. Um, to, to see if it works and how it works and what the quirks of it are. So before we dig into the question of can it work as a model or as a can it actually be implemented, how did you do the the modelling, the sort of the the experimentation around it, and what can you learn from it and what can't you learn from it? Right. Um, well, my thanks to Haley for the, the legal description. When the baton's passed to the economist to say, how do you model this? I think it's worth just setting out the building blocks for a good economic model. And there are three. There are inputs, which is stuff that you shove into the model that you know, the known knowns, to quote Donald Rumsfeld. There are variables, which is the stuff that you tweak in the model, the known unknowns. 
And then there's the outputs, which is the results of that modeling exercise. And it doesn't get much more complicated than those three steps, inputs, variables, and outputs. So with that, maybe just shed light on what each of these three components would consist of in this case. The inputs for a good ER model would have to include record label revenues, which we have this wonderful organization, the BPI, which has a, does a great job at tracking that. If you're going to involve an organization like PPL, you'd need to think about the administration cost they would charge, how much of that money would go to non-featured artists, something that was rarely touched on in the discussions. And then if you're going to partition streaming data, you may need to break that streaming data out into push and pull rates. So how much of that streaming was like radio? You know, Spotify, Apple prepared that song for you. How much of it was like on-demand stream? I chose that song and I'm going to add it to my commute to work playlist. These would all be the inputs. Then the variables would be the stuff that you tweak before you get to your outcomes. And a key variable here would be what is the rate that you're going to license this actual remuneration at? And that's where you can have a proper thist thumping desk or debate about what is the right rate. And then the output would be to say, well, what's the net effect of all of this modeling work? Now, remember, in the current model, record labels receive a ton of money from streaming, and they pass a good chunk of that to artists. So artists are receiving money. That's a really important point. The net effect is, would they receive more or less money if you were to intervene in the market and introduce this new approach called equitable remuneration? Bringing that up for air, and I know that we're going to get into the weeds in a second, but just when the argument was simply we want 50-50 money, that is, we only see 50% of every streaming pound, that source. Mm. Once you think about inputs, variables, and outputs, you immediately see it's not going to be that straightforward. There's going to be twists and turns along this journey, which could take you in a different direction. I mean, it's, it's easy to see, isn't it, from an, you know, from an artist's perspective, an artist who feels that they're not getting paid enough, which is a common, which mm -hmm. was a common um, statement from lots of artists. And, you know, I, I, we're all sympathetic to artists' needs. Um, yes. so they were thinking that they, did, they didn't get paid enough. And, and the, the, the sort of the simplified dangling carrot of equitable remuneration sort of says, hey, 50-50 sounds great, right? But it, I mean, it's obviously not that simple. Now, Will, you recently discussed, I'm going to call it ER from now on, just to make it easy, um, <laughs> ER at uh, the Copyright Society. And you discussed three different forms of it, different ways that it could be implemented. I'd like to go through each of these and let's get Haley's opinion on how it could work legally and then Will can perhaps explain the, the economics of it. So th there's three versions. What do each of these mean? What would they result in from your relative perspectives? The first one is blanket ER, which is putting the entire, I guess, UK streaming economy through PPL and making equitable remuneration ER work that way. Haley, um, le legally, is that possible? So anything is possible in law, absolutely. You know, like I said, it's just this thing. We just make these rules up and we decide this is how it works. And as in, as long as we, you know, comply with international standards that we have, and as I said, ER exists in different forms around the world already. So yes, it would absolutely be possible. Whether we would agree that that's the best way to do it or not is a completely different story. Uh, in the evidence at the time, lots of people did say that basically, not to get too technical and boring about it, but it's this whole thing about like, a um actual remuneration that currently applies to radio uh through, because it falls under a tiny category of law that's like you can have er for uh communication to the public and broadcast but not for making available and making available is the on-demand streaming and so what you could do if you if it was a, if it was agreed that this is the best approach like legally you could structure um making available to come under some, the the communication to the public so you know it's I'm not necessarily, we're not sure on the best way to do it, but legally it's possible to do it that way. And then because PPL already pay the ER for radio, so you would just be expanding their remit in a practical sense. And legally, that's how you would do it. In terms of like, with law, it's always like this, what's the unintended consequences? Because the scope of the law is really important that you only want to capture what you're trying to capture and you don't want it to be too broad. Um, and so it wouldn't be that straightforward because if you expand everything on the internet, if you put making available within communication to the public, you're then encapsulating everything online, basically. Uh, so it would be uh, technically 
challenging to do that. But the whole point in ER is that it is there, like the principle, the legal reason why we have this thing called ER in law is that when a creator transfers a right and they have a weakening, weakened bargaining power due to the market, it's a way for the law to ensure that they get some kind of fair share of the remuneration for the work. And so when in the in the way that it works in law is that when they transfer currently the rights to their communication to the public and broadcast in exchange, there's this ER. And so what you could do is then, and what happened uh, in Kevin Brennan's bill was where a performer transfers their making available right, so that's the on-demand right, they would get ER payment uh right in exchange for that so yeah it is possible legally okay just incredibly incredibly complicated <laughs> uh thank you Hayley. well economically then how does that will it w- would it work this is like a relay race where we pass yeah, a baton from it. one to the other um so we've got i'm going to keep talking in three so it's an easy way to digest this complex spaghetti um we've got three cooks in the kitchen we've got a streaming company we've got record labels and we've got artists and under this first scenario, which is blanket ER, just take the entire business. And we're talking here about a billion pounds or a billion dollars to say it, a billion pounds of streaming revenues. And we're going to shove it all down PPL's pipe for distribution. What's the net effect of that? Well, firstly, streaming services are unchanged. And in my model, I use 52% as 52% of all the revenue they get, they pass to record labels. Now, 52% of all the revenue they get, they pass to PPL. So there's no change for the streaming services. Record labels get the body blow because they lose all that money at source. They lose half of what's being distributed. And artists then suddenly gain because they're seeing a whole lot more money at source than they would have done through recoupment of their record contracts. So just to recap, in this scenario, streaming services unchanged, record labels lose, and artists gain. But if I can just add one quick footnote before handing back to you there, there is a important dynamic here, which is record labels are international and they have international CFOs who are looking for an internal rate of return on their investments. So the big cloud for this scenario for me is what international CFO is going to give budget to UK record labels to invest when the return on that investment has been adjusted negatively. That's an important consideration about how ER plays out. Artists may gain in period one, they may feel pain in period two. Okay, so the second uh, version of ER is Spanish top-up equitable remuneration, uh, which I thought was a dance craze, but uh, is not. (laughs) Um, Now, this is adding a a levy on top of the DSP's cost of goods and paying artists, um, is the description that Will has supplied for me. Um, Hayley, how does this model work in comparison to the one we just discussed, the, the, the everything into the pipe model? And... Uh, what is the likelihood that this could become legally viable? The rules are flexible and you can kind of make them work however you want to do it. But you always have to consider what the unintended consequences of the law and how the market or the business or the industry will shift based on the new rules, right? So um, if you, like Will was saying, maybe there'll be a negative impact, but, but not because of what the law, the principle, the idea says, but because of the way that the rights holders respond to the new rules. Uh, and I think it's the same, maybe with all of them, but so far, it's like, yeah, you, it's a, everything is, it's a good idea, but it's how it plays out in reality is actually whether it's going to be useful or not. Um, and a lot of, basically the question is like who's footing the bill isn't it because where does the money come from if you're trying to give uh you're trying to redistribute the wealth and the pushback will be from whoever you take the wealth away from and give it to the other the other people and what will they do to respond to that will in it will determine if overall it's effective for the whole industry um and you know sometimes that the the impact of the decision, like you said, like Will said, it could end up being more negative in the long run for creative. It could be, although we're all, this is all crystal ball prediction, we don't know. Um, and it requires cooperation from everybody that the intended goal is to redistribute the wealth in order for it to work either way. Does that make sense? It's like everything, we're, all, we're at the mercy of like the cooperation of everyone, regardless of what the law says. From a legal perspective, uh, all, all the options are viable. 
Um, and we and you don't decide things like how um, the money is split at that level anyway. You would go to like, for instance, the Copyright Tribunal decided the rate for current radio ER. It's not decided it by uh, by the legislature. Well, obviously, the music industry is notoriously good at collaborating uh, and agreeing on things. So, but yes, yeah, so possible. But again, it's so the, what we're really seeing is that, is that the, the tension between the intended outcome, and this is actually shining light onto the, the whole the whole process that we've reported on of moving to a new model is, I'm going to say, intensely complicated and, and difficult. It sounds there's a lot of agreement to be found and machinations to go on. Um, thanks, Haley. Well. Um, the Spanish top up ER. How does that work, first of all, and yeah. how economically could, um, could it be applied? Well, you describe Spanish top up as a dance craze. It sounds to me like more like a drink you'd have by the beach, but still, let's just keep to our three cooks it could in the be kitchen both. and keep it. <laughs> there could be a line of causality there too. The more you drink, the more you dance. Um, so let's just go back to our three cooks in the kitchen. In the first example, the blanket ER. It was artists' gain and labels' pain. Streaming was agnostic. In this example, and what makes this example so fascinating is it's in practice, it's in play. It's streaming services feel the pain and artists feel the gain and labels are agnostic. So labels sail through unaffected under this intervention. Streaming services would have to pay an extra amount of money on top of their rev share and artists would see that money. And... Again, you know, from a legal perspective, and I defer to Haley here, the fact that this is in play, I think in Spain, and I think she can comment more about other countries which are looking to adopt this, you know, that's interesting. It has, it's not theory, it's in practice. But the important footnote for me to understand here is when, you know, following Musicality's coverage of the inquiry, I learned that the Spanish agency that manages this top-up levy pays money into the International Reciprocal Network. So PPL receives around about 400,000 euros a year from the Spanish top-up levy, which is interesting. So Spain benefits, but international artists benefit because they plug into the international network as well. Right, so it's, it's already happening somewhere, and yeah. British artists are already benefiting from it. That's an easier argument, isn't it? That raised a few eyebrows. Okay, and just to jump in here, if you're finding this useful and you'd like more of this in-depth news and trusted analysis waiting for you in your inbox every morning, as well as access to all of our industry-leading reports, head on over to musically.com slash subscribe. And you, yes, you may be eligible for a free Music Ally subscription via our corporate and sponsored subscriptions. So if you work for a DSP, a major label, an indie label, or if you're an artist manager, an employee of a CMO or a publisher, you can check to see if it's available for you. Uh, it's musically.com slash subscription dash options. There's a link below the podcast to check out as well. Okay, let's go back to the interview. Okay, the third one then, it already exists in the UK, is radio equitable remuneration. So radio is radio. And this idea is where radio style streamings on DSPs are treated as radio and licensed with a radio tariff. Haley, how complicated would it then be to classify s- certain streams legally as radio and other streams not? And, w- and would you relish that opportunity? <laughs> Absolutely. I think this one is the lawyer's dream because we love when the law says a word and we spend the next t- 10 years figuring out what this word means. And, you know... Um, Their mission is your commission. Yeah, literally. That's, 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 that's <laughs> you know, the lawyer's favourite option, I reckon. But um, well, exactly that. Every, so all the time, the every single word in the law is like, you know, they choose it very specifically. And we we litigate over it. Like we go to court and argue about the meaning of one word and, and whether that word means that thing in this instance. So from a legal perspective, even though that probably sounds completely crazy, um, that's the kind of thing we do all the time. In terms of like whether you could actually do it with streaming, I mean, it's up for debate, isn't it? And we saw this in the, in the inquiry that you people could argue based on the technology or the way that the consumers interact with the technology, you know, like a playlist that just plays to you. Is that really different to uh, radio? The thing with law is that we try to, we, (laughs) speaking on behalf of law, um, law is supposed to last more than two weeks, right? So you can't make a law that says TikTok must pay this amount because, you know, TikTok just changes name and then or it will, you know, die out and there'll be a new 
craze. So you, you try to make law that has longevity. So you try to make law not too technologically specific, but you want to try it at the same time and capture the things that, as I said earlier, you want to, you've got a goal. So we're trying to capture uh, streaming, but we don't maybe want to capture just websites that are just like there or something, you know, whatever it is. Um, and this is a balance that you're always seeing in law, but it happens. We do make specific laws that um, respond specifically to certain types of technology. We could argue, though, for the rest of ever about whether streaming actually is the same or different to radio play. And I think that in a way, it's quite sh- sometimes it can be short sighted to use an old metaphor for a new technology because it's a bit like saying, oh, email is like post, but it's not like post. It's email and it's different. Uh, so sometimes using yeah. that kind of meta- backwards metaphorical understanding of something. It's how the brain works. It's how mm. we figure out things. But with law, it's not always the best way to move forward and have longevity in the scope of the law. As a side, I mean, this might be a stupid question. Uh, in a sort of very basic way, how is radio play defined at the moment then? Is it, is it to do with the... the the technology is it to do with the consumption how is that how is that d- defined so in law we don't define the word radio it's like we have this word called broadcast and we have communication to the public and those are like the legal categories it's all really confusing and interesting because lots of these laws were written first at eu level so they were first written in french and then they were translated into english and so words like um broadcast can actually mean slightly different things in different languages and also at the time when the law was written what a broadcast was was not what we think of now as a broadcast and some of the laws will say things like by any technical means so it's the point it's not actually about how the um so for instance like copyright infringement you can infringe a copyright by any technical means they don't care whether you do it on your phone or your laptop or whatever the point is you made a copy because it's about what the law is trying to achieve. But to a certain extent, things like broadcast and communication to the public are grounded in the technology because that's why we have that law, because somebody invented this technology and then we needed the law to respond. Uh, Will, with that in mind, um, this was this was suggested in the, the inquiry as a sort of likely route out, that the music that is streamed by a user from a DSP that they didn't select themselves, that the DSP was selecting on their behalf, algorithmically or, or however, uh, is like radio, and therefore it can or it can be sort of crowbarred into an existing framework around radio. Uh, how does does that work economically? What 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 might happen? Well, firstly, I'd just like to compliment Haley on upholding the English tradition of blaming the French. It reminds me of George W. Bush when he said, France was all Europe and the French don't have a word for entrepreneur, a fine presidential remark. And this, this particular debate goes back to the oral hearings and that wonderful moment when Kevin Brennan asked my dear friend and former colleague, Horatio Guterres, now at Disney, then at Spotify, um, how to switch the radio feature off. And he didn't know how to do it. And it was live on camera and you can cite it in your transcript notes. But that raised the question of, well, if Spotify calls it radio and we're disputing the legal definition of radio, well, if it looks like a pig and squawks like a pig, it's probably a pig and we can call it radio. So then we go back to what I said at the very beginning of the podcast, which is our inputs, variables and outputs. Let's just go back to our three cooks in that kitchen and walk you through what happens if we distribute this money like it's radio, hard to see half of it at source, but we license it like it's radio. And I would quickly like to cite my longtime mentor, professional and personal mentor, David Sapir, who said, if you want ER on the money that comes out, does that also mean ER on the money that comes in? So what we're going to do is we're going to take two thirds of all the streams and shove that down the on-demand route. That is, we'll just license it like it's always been licensed, 52% of revenue share, and that flows through to the record labels, artists recoup against their advances, and the world carries on. Easy. The one third then goes to PPL, and they will license it at the highest rate they've ever achieved in history, which is 22.5%, not 52%. In fact, not even half of 52%. That's important. They then will deduct the admin fee and pay non-featured artists, who, by the way, have already been paid an upfront session fee for playing a tambourine or doing the backing vocals in the studio. Labels then receive half that 
and the featured artists receive less than half of that again. So as this money flows through, A, it gets licensed for less, and B, there's deductions on the way before it gets to the artist's bank account. Let's go back to our three results here, because this is where it gets really interesting. The streaming services now win, okay? So they are going to see a 15 16% reduction in their cost of goods, because a third of those streams are not being licensed at 52%, they're being licensed at 22.5%. So they get a benefit. The labels, well, of course they're going to lose because they've lost control of a third of those streams and only see a half of that third, which comes through PPL. So they're seeing less than half of less than half. But this is where it gets really interesting. The final cook in the kitchen is the artist. What happens to them when you treat radio like radio for money coming in and for money coming out? They lose. They see a 10% reduction because... The rate that's been licensed is so low and the deductions that happen in the way are so big, they actually find themselves being worse off. So in this final scenario, we have a situation where there's one winner, streaming services, and two losers, artists and labels. Right. So we focus a lot of time on equitable remuneration. And is what you're saying then that actually this is artists will generally be worse off? under any implementation of equitable remuneration? I think there are instances where they can gain, but where they gain frequently, it's labels that lose. And then you have to think dynamically in terms of, well, who's going to invest in UK artists going forward? That is outside of the economic model, outside of the legal detail that Haley deals with. The CFOs running these record labels look at the UK as a poor return on investment. So I think that is a really big concern, especially when UK artists are struggling to break on a global level. I can't think of an artist since Dua Lipa that's really broken globally. And Britain used to break loads of global artists. That's just a personal bug in my basement concern that I'm having. Um, but I think the interesting one is the most explicitly clear example to come out of 200 written responses and nine oral hearings in the inquiry is to say, okay, I'll take radio streams and I'll license them like their radio and I'll distribute them like their radio. And for a fairly objective model with good grounded assumptions to come out with an outcome where artists lose is really eye-opening to me. In terms of then moving forwards, if what you're saying is it doesn't look like that might be a solution that actually fulfills what artists want. There's two things here, right? Artists want to be paid more and people who are receiving money and are happy with it want to protect that amount of money that they're receiving. And yet there's, there's a tension there that it feels like change is needed. But to both of you, what do you think those changes might be? And, Will, we've talked about this previously. You've written a guest post about this, about the, the price point. It, you know, one, another way of looking at it is more money goes in, more money comes out. So which of these things are, more, are, are needed or are they work, need to be working tandem? Hayley, what do you think? So I go back to what I said earlier, that I don't think there is one solution and um, we need a combination of changes to update the music industry to make it more fairer for everybody. There's four research projects going on. Uh, three of them are done at the UK IPO, one that's in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. And we've got the, con- the working groups doing their thing. There's two of those, one's on data and one is on contract transparency. Uh, and there will be a review by the select committee. So things are moving forward. Um, but like we said, ER is already in place um, and the cost of the streaming services is the same everywhere and hasn't changed for 10 years. So um, if those mechanisms are already in place and yet the price is the same, like then you can't actually necessarily assume that that would change the consumer price. Although I do genuinely believe that the consumer price should be incrementally in- increasing over time. It's weird that it stayed the same the whole time. Um, And things like, so it's not just in the music industry as well. So streaming applies also to performers. So Netflix pay uh, a kind of top up ER to actors through actors unions in certain European countries. And yet the price of Netflix is the same for the user. I know you said earlier about it's the notorious that the uh, industry won't agree because there are people with different viewpoints. But I do know from the UK IPO that they have these working groups and they're making progress. And so maybe actually we could be a bit more uh, positive about the possibility of the industry making uh, changes internally rather than necessarily there needing to be a legal mechanism pushed on them to make things fairer. But also users, you know, people 
there is a whole entire market of you know ethical purchasers who if they had the choice and they understood that their artists are going to get paid same as like you know if you're going to buy free range eggs or slow fashion or whatever you know thanks Heidi uh so Will what is a likely next step in terms of what is trying to be achieved here the, the big picture the big economic picture as you said before that the price for buying a streaming subscription has remained the same for so long well we're in a cost of living crisis inflation is hurting people people are trying to stretch money so how long are we gonna to have to wait for that to happen well, let me tackle this one in two stages. Uh, firstly, I'll address the evidence and what that all means to the inquiry and build on Haley's excellent remarks. And secondly, turn to the, the very sensitive issue of, of price and inflation now a an awful lot higher than when I published the work on the Music Ally website called Melb Economics, inspired, by the way, by drinking copious amounts of Melbeck with Haley after some legal do in the city of London. Um, let's go to the evidence. And this is really important. And if me and Haley were in charge of this inquiry, this is where you'd have the natural tension. Prior to coming into the music industry, I was a government economist working under the shadow of Gordon Brun, our Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. And he used to always say to the economists, you have to strive for evidence-based policy making and avoid the temptation of policy-based evidence making. So give me the objective evidence to which I can form a view. Don't give me your view and find evidence to justify it. That's crucial here. And there's a four-letter word I want to introduce to this whole debate about what's happened over the past three years. Remember, this is the three-year inquiry, and it's still dragging on. And that is some, S-O-M-E, some. Some artists complained about the money they're receiving from streaming. But there was a selection bias in that there's an awful lot of artists who are incredibly happy with their deal terms and seeing a lot of success. I know one old folk artist who's just signed a deal for £600,000 advance. They are not complaining about the terms of their deal, but they were, those voices weren't heard. And that's, that's just a simple rule of retail. You never hear compliments, you always hear complaints. But there's a lot of compliments that are not being heard. Another sum is, as the inquiry proceeded, some publishers felt they should see more. And back to our three cooks in the kitchen, <laughs> we're adding a fourth cook here. That means potentially artists and labels should see less. So then the debate moves from artists not seeing enough to songwriters and publishers should see more and the artists should see less. Equally, I think what should be applauded was the work of Sony Music with their artists forward. Their, I call it a debt jubilee. You know, Pre-2000 advances were wiped off and those artists would see royalties as opposed to recruitment. And that's been grandfathered in now. I think that could go further. You know, I, I don't think it would be a damaging thing to have a minimum royalty rate in the UK music industry. I think it'd be quite an interesting signal to the market. It doesn't solve everything, but just to say no artists in this country get signed for less than 25%, I don't think that would be too hard to stomach and would have great optics. But then the arching point about the whole inquiry, and I've made this point again and again and again, even in the pages of Music Ally, it's a very simple line, which is yes, all the evidence points to the music industry in this country is making more money. No one's disagreeing with that. But we have way more mouths to feed. And if I was to say to you that since Spotify launched in the UK, the number of artists in this country has more than doubled. The number of songwriters in this country has more than trebled. You should celebrate that. You shouldn't commiserate about that. You should celebrate it. But you don't need to have a master's in economics to do the arithmetic. And you have more money, but way more mouths to feed there will be attention. So what is the problem you're trying to solve is the economist question. And if it's that, well, that wasn't discussed much during the inquiry. But I believe it is that simple anomaly of a supply side explosion like we've never had before. Joe, think about this for a second. Today, there will be 65,000 unique e-duplicated songs being loaded up into Spotify. That's the same volume of music that was released in the calendar year of 1984. I don't want to get old Orwellian on you, but that's a really interesting observation about just how much supply has changed under streaming. That's what we're dealing with. The other thing that wasn't broadly discussed, I don't think, although there was a lot discussed, was the amount that people pay. You know, I've paid the same amount for Spotify for yeah, like, well, since I signed up in two thousand seven. I think you know, like, like the same amount. You know, and now obviously that's worth a lot less. Uh, and with the economic situation of the world, I don't know. It's flexible every day isn't it but you know there's, there's a truism here which is you know Haley, you said people are 
are very aware now of the economic re- repercussions of this. They they know that um, uh, where the money goes. They know that Taylor Swift wants to own her masters, etc. Is is there a sort of does there need to be a more sort of open discussion about okay if we want this if we want more artists for, money for artists we've got to pay more right? It's a huge part of the debate that was never had. That is, it's not for politicians to say consumers should pay more. It's not for the Competition and Markets Authority to say consumers should pay more. It wasn't for anybody on those stands, the hearings, to say, we believe consumers should pay more. So I thought, I'll say it. And to explain the historical context of this, it's a hilarious story. We're going to go back to the 3rd of December, 2001, not that long after 9-11. And Rhapsody got their license for 15,000 catalog songs under the premise that if it costs $9.99 to rent movies from Blockbuster Video, that's what it should cost to rent music. 2001. I am now speaking to Joe and Haley on the eve of October 2022, and in sterling euro and dollar, which currently are all the same rate, it is still $9.99 for 82 million songs. So the pricing conundrum for me is twofold. And I'm going to apologize to President Harry Truman here. He said, get me an economist who's only got one arm. So we say, on one hand this, on the other hand that. On one hand, and I have two arms, I'm going to use them. On one hand, we have this situation where we're offering more and more music, but we're charging less and less for it. Not to bombard you with arithmetic here, but 2.3 people paying $14.99, which is the average family plan participation, produces £6.50 a month. That's less than $9.99. Discounts, student plans, discount the price down again. Inflation erodes the price down again. And that's where you realise that all the world's music, all those 82 million songs, on demand, Offline, no adverse, costs less than a medium glass of Malbec wine. Cheers to that. Now, then you have to say, where do we go from here? We're charging less and less, but offering more and more, something statisticians call hedonic pricing, cloud computing, a unit of cloud halves every three years, so we use more cloud and it makes more money. We've commoditized the good. So how do we get out of this? This is where I call it squeaky bum time, because what do you do? Do you start jacking prices up with inflation? Or do you look at Netflix, where we're currently, for every 100 new subscribers to Netflix they get in, they lose 138 going out. So we should be careful what we wish for, given I wrote Malbec Economics in a time where inflation was zero and interest rates were zero. And I'm speaking to Haley and Joe today when inflation is close to 10% and interest rates could be at 5% this time next year. I am risk averse. One thing this industry, this British industry, has not done today is lost subscribers. Spotify is still growing. Apple still growing. YouTube is ramping up and Amazon's introduced new features. This business is growing. And I just wouldn't want to risk that growth mm. with price increases. Yes. I mean, like everything in the world at the moment, we're living in uncertain and weird times. And I think we'll we'll see how it it, it, would, it feels simple on the surface to say, well, let's make it uh, $10.99 a month and try that for a bit. But the... We are. You know, this is a very difficult time for a lot of people, and those small movements could make uh, enormous have enormous repercussions, couldn't they? Listen, um, thank you so much, Haley and Will. I'm going to put links below the podcast to both of your respective uh, websites, and people can come and uh, dig much deeper into all of the many things you've published all over the world, and uh, and try and get more of a grip on on this. Um, and I, I feel like we're going to be speaking about this again in the future. Uh, and perhaps that would be a good idea to take stock. You know, this is this something is going to happen here, but it's it's kind of and we can see the direction it's going in, but we haven't perhaps narrowed that uh, light cone of uh, possibility yet into something more specific. So uh, well, let's speak again in the future and and see where we are and see how much we're paying then, and uh, we can, we can we can see what's really happened. So uh, Haley and Will, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And there we go. So if you found that useful, please share this podcast on with someone else who you think will also get something out of it. And if you'd like to email me and uh, give me your thoughts, it's joe at musically.com. That's joe at musically.com. Don't forget, we have a free weekly email called The Knowledge, which rounds up a bit of this and a bit of that of the best analysis, news, marketing, insight and skills from Music Ally. There's a link below the podcast. So sign up and impress your boss. Uh, And don't forget as well, you can check out to see if you are eligible for a free Music Ally subscription. That link is also beneath the podcast. So that's it for me, Joe Sparrow. Uh, Until next time, farewell.